Good morning, renovation. How's them donuts today? Yeah, everybody give Clint a round of applause. Yeah. So I'm Pastor Tucker, if you guys are new here. Dustin is on vacation. He's taking his pastor appreciation on vacation. Um, No bulletins today. Because they went on vacation. <laughs> so we got a big need right now. We need candy for that fall festival. Big time need candy. So if you guys at Walmart, pick up a bag, bring it in. We have a bucket out there, right? Yeah. We got a bucket out there. Okay, so we also... We... Uh, what else do we need? we need? Do we need exhibits? Yes. If you want to have a little carnival game or a trunk or whatever, we have a sign-out sheet in the lobby. Yes, okay. That's a big weekend. That weekend is going to have the Thursday and Friday is going to be the youth rally. So if you guys know a youth, invite them to that. We're going to feed. We're going to have games and prizes and preaching. I'm bringing the word one night and then Pastor Dustin the other night. It's going to be awesome. I already know. And then that Saturday is going to be... A dodgeball tournament, so if you want to get on a team, you're probably going to get beat by, I got me and the, some of the guys, and we're going to win, I already know it, I already know it. Um, also, big news, big, everybody look at me, big news, Mountain Grove plant is coming November 13th, yeah, that's like a month away, oh, I'm so nervous, I'm excited, okay, is that all? All right, so if you're new to renovation, we're going to turn the lights off, music will get real loud, it's, it's going to be awesome, I already know, all right, let's pray. Have a seat, welcome to Renovation Church, I'm Pastor Hayden, uh, Pastor D is on vacation, uh, don't forget it is Pastor Appreciation Month. We were gonna, I think we were supposed to honor the pastor today, so he took off. Um, I don't know. So whatever you were gonna give him, my box is out there. It says Hayden, or maybe PhD. I don't know what it says. I haven't seen it. But no, I want to tell you how good your pastor is. I walked in this morning to look at my notes, and this was sitting right here, and the dates today. And he told me that I was prayed for. So. We'll cut that out of the video, um, but but no, we do have a good pastor. They're on, they're they're back from vacation, but the way we do things at church is he has to miss a Sunday, and I think that's good. Um, he's in church this morning. I promise. I think I know where he went, but I'm not positive. I'll probably find out later. Um, but he is in church, and uh, so they're having a great day. But it is uh, our pastors do a lot. So so listen, I'll be honest. Last year I got cards and I loved reading them. So. Just write a simple card, uh, anything. Uh, by the way, we're glad to be back. We were gone last week, if you guys noticed. If you didn't, that's great. Um, I heard the music was a little bit quiet. That's probably the only reason you noticed I wasn't here. Um, but no, wait, I thank all the people that fill in when we're gone. This next gen that we're raising is a very important. Um, but they're, they're doing a go- an awesome job, and I even called James next gen. Look at that. But, uh, no, we had a great vacation is what we need is the first vacation we've got to take with our whole family, with Haley included. And so we had an awesome time. Uh, minus when you lose your kid for an hour in a very long hike with 80-foot cliffs to the water, um, you, you learn to pray a little different. Uh, we were all praying a little different. Haley was making some very inappropriate jokes. She does not handle stress well. She would look over the edge and look at Terry and goes, there's not a dead body here. Um, so don't let Haley go with you in a tense situation. You want somebody a little bit more grounded. We found him in his defense. He was not lost. He knew right where he was, and he was right where we told him to be. He was at the beach. It just wasn't where we were looking. So, But we were glad we found him after about an hour and... I think it's an hour and four minutes he was officially gone. Um, so uh, we are glad to be back. We had a great trip. But uh, I, 
if you heard when I was praying there, I've, I've wrestled all week with this message. It's actually been a while. And I felt like Jacob, like I was wrestling with God. And I got a great group on a text message. And I sent a message out last night as I was studying once again. And I said, I need prayer. And the prayer started rolling in and the, the words of encouragement, like, I don't care what it is, say it. And so I know I did watch Pastor D's message from last week. I don't know which service you were at. If you were not at the 9 o'clock, I recommend going and watching it. So if you have hate mail after today, send it to D.S. Cartwright. I'm not even sure if he's a, at Gmail, I believe. I think he's a Gmail guy. So if I say something today that really ruffles your feathers you don't like, talk to Pastor D when he gets back from vacation. No, I'm serious, but I want you to understand everything I'm talking about today is out of love. Um, we're going to be in the Bible, obviously. If you don't have one, raise your hand. I got people that'll get you one. Maybe not. There's only one. Are we out? We got more. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We will go find them. Um, we're going to be in Romans. If you want to start turning into Romans, but I've wrestled with this message. But I, I got to thinking about. We were in Texas at a conference. Kind of got my mind rolling. Uh, everything I've studied, everything I've heard, got my mind rolling towards this. Is how crazy this nation is. Like how crazy this nation is. And I'm not talking about the world today. I'm not talking about the end of times today. I'm not talking about the rapture of the church. I'm talking about America. Okay, I'm talking about our nation, where we live, the craziness in the news that we're seeing. And I got to thinking, like, how did we get here? Like, how, how did we get here? And then I, I found some scripture that I believe explains exactly how we got here. And it's in Romans. So I want to break it down for you today. I'll be looking at my notes a lot because I got a lot of statistics and a lot of, a lot of numbers I want to share as we're going through. But we're going to be in Romans 1. And I'm going to be verse 18 all the way through 32, but I'm going to break it down in sections so I don't get lost. Um, I got to thinking about how did we get here, and then I got to thinking about what's next. Like, where are we headed now? Can it get crazier? I don't know those answers. But when I started reading these scriptures, it put me, it put and showed me exactly how we got to where we're at as a nation. So I want to share it with you guys. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. So if we read this, we're going to start Romans 1, 18, and I'm going to read 18 and 20, and then we're going to talk about that for a minute says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness all unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them what can be known about God is plain guys it's simple because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power divine nature has clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and these things have been made so with it you are without excuse. So that's starting it out, right? Verse 16, wrath of God revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness. Verse 19, for us it is plain and easy. It goes all the way back to creation, how easy God made it for redemption for each and every one of us. It's plain. It's simple. But verse 20 is a scary one, right? You're sitting in here, so you under, you know, you've heard the truth. You just heard it, how easy it is, so there's no excuse. That's the scary part of this first part. There is no excuse for you not to understand what it takes to get this country going right and what it takes for you to be on an eternal path to heaven. No excuses. So I was working on this message, and I, I heard these scriptures from a pastor, um, Billy Crone, in, in Dallas, but he didn't, he didn't preach on this. He just said, look at these scriptures. It's the nation. I'm like, whatever. Jot it down. I went home and studied it. I'm like, okay, this is spot on. So we ask how we got here. How we got here. There's people in the room that may be, well, there's people in the room a lot older than me. There's people in the room a lot younger than me. And when I'm bashing your generation, don't get mad at me because I'm going to bash mine, okay? But we're going to start in the 1950s. And I believe in Scripture, it starts at Romans 21 through 23. We're talking about the boomers here, 1955, 1964. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they came futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. See, I think right there is the 1950s, maybe through the 60s. It was a different time in America. Some of you lived it. You know this. If you're hearing me, you know it was a different time. Very few TVs were in the home. Very few. Marriage, the marriage bed was still sacred in the 50s. Still sacred. Life was still sacred in the 50s. Sex outside of marriage was still called a sin. The 50s was a different time. They were still a God-fearing people. I'm not sure we are. I'm not necessarily talking about this room. Remember, I'm talking about America. I'm talking about the USA. I don't think we're God-fearing anymore. Some of the top movies. Anybody in here want to raise their hand like I lived those days? Ten Commandments, one of the top movies. Ten Commandments. There was a movie called Picnic. It was a love story of a former football player falling in love. Spoiler alert, there was no sex, there was no nudity, there was no language. The Red Badge of Courage is a war about World War II. Cinderella came out in the 50s. Singing in the Rain came out in the 50s. It was a different era. People were still God-fearing. 80%, don't get mad at me, 80% of the ladies were homemakers. They stayed home and raised their kids, taught their kids morals. But see, there was also a shift happening in the 50s. Before the 50s, we were even more God-fearing. This whole country was built, started from this. It started from this. You got to remember this. Now we're getting in the 50s, and it's going this way from this. There's a shift happening. There's a shift. It's what once was hidden in the darkness. Well, it was hidden in the corners and the in the underworld. Is now starting to hit mainstream. Strip clubs are starting to show up on Main Street, not in the basement somewhere. The bars that were once hidden down hidden underground because they had to be, are starting to come up on the main roads. There's a shift away from God starting in the 50s. You all know what I think is a huge, a huge reason this started? In the 1950s, evolution was introduced into the public school. A public school that once taught the Bible, once prayed every day, taught the Bible, taught creation, let science push evolution in, and where the two were, only one won out, and that was evolution creation of the Bible is gone from our kids. You want to change a nation, you change the kids. They're the next leaders. You change the kids, you start changing a the nation. They start changing the kids in the 50s with the live evolution. It started this crazy shift. In 1963, there's a video, I'm going to play right here, three-minute video, and listen to these words in 1963 by the great Paul Harvey. If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the. So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington, and then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, 
I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want it until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Hmm. Spot on for today, isn't he? So that takes us to, uh, to the next, to Gen X, 65 through 1980. Romans 1, 24 and 25, we start talking about the generation of the 60s and 70s. Let me read it, and we'll, we'll break it down here. Therefore, God gave them up to their lust of their hearts, to their impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and served the Creator. Worship and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Sixties and seventies. There's a lot of people here lived it. The lust of the heart turned very impure. Start thinking about it. Free love, sex, drugs, rock and roll was going crazy. Sex was taken out of the marriage bed. It was, it was brought to the public. Have sex with anybody, whatever makes, it, whatever makes you happy. The sexual revolution was on fire, and it was pushing the nation farther from God. Just like Paul Harvey said, what would I do if I was a devil? I'd keep doing what I'm doing. You can watch it progress through the 60s. Woodstock. All these times you look back at the pictures. Craziness. But what did a country do to start accepting it, right? There's a turning toward paganism in the USA. You truly want to look at it, it's a turning towards paganism that we're still, as a nation, running towards. Still. As a nation, we're running towards it, just like the ancient world. Said history repeats itself. Read the history. We're repeating it. Identical. Identical. It brought, the 60s and 70s brought an absolute revival for the occult and witchcraft. A revival in these. Another detriment to God and what God calls right. 1969, I believe. 1969, no-fault divorce on demand. You could get divorced from your spouse, because I want to today. What God calls right, what God calls holy, what God, God's holy marriage could be broken up, because today, I don't want to be married to you. Change the world. Change the world. Absolutely change what God calls good. You realize if you look through the Bible, and most of the stuff is an attack on biblical marriage, the stuff we're seeing today is an attack on biblical marriage. Look, think about it. Think about half the stuff I'm talking about. It's an attack. 1950, 21% divorce rate of married people. 21%. By the 60s and 80s, it had doubled into the 40s, and now we're over 50. Half the people that get married get divorced. Why? Because we're turning into a pagan world. We're turning into to do what you want. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. It doesn't matter. 
We talked about evolution coming out in the 50s in the school. It started getting worse, right? So what did we do? Did we fix it as a Christians? No. We let them take prayer out. We let them take prayer out of the school in 1962. You could not pray in the public school. You think the school got better? Is it any better today? No. Our kids can pray in school. I'll bail them out of jail. Things are going downhill fast, but do we start changing? No. There was a turning away from God every day. Once again, took prayer out of the school. If the enemy can get your kids in that generation, what happens? The next generation? It's worse, right? It's, it's worse. Think about it. It seems like the past reveals itself over and over. Think about the clothing right now. Is the clothing that he's wearing in the 60s. I seen bell bombs the other day. I went shopping with Tara a couple years ago. I couldn't believe the outfits. I'm like, what is this? She's like, everything comes around. I'm like, that's why my closet's full of old clothes. She wants me to throw them away. We talked about this the other day. I said, it'll all be back. <laughs> and one of these days, I might fit back into them. I don't know. That's a whole different, that's a whole different topic right there. But everything, everything just comes around. You know, I think about the Israelites and all the crazy stuff they did, and we're doing it. We're doing it as Christians. It's scary. It's scary, but in the 60s, there was an apostasy happening. There was a turning, an absolute blunt turning away from God. Like, we don't want this. We want to have sex with anybody we want. We want to have drugs infiltrated the country like crazy, crazy. And a lot of the drugs that hit were mind-altering drugs for a reason. Start diving into that stuff. You got to dive deeper every time to get more of a high. They started diving into psychedelic drugs like crazy to go to their parties. It got a little bit worse. You think, how can it get worse? 1970. 1970, I think, is a pivotal point for us turning back to paganism. 1970, abortion on demand. Abortion on demand started in 1970. The sanctity of life was no more in the U.S. As a nation, the sanctity of life did not matter. We was telling God, we don't care that you developed, that you created babies. We can kill them at will. Think about it. It's crazy. It's crazy. The Israelites sacrificed babies to a god named Moloch. They took their babies, and half the time, you don't hear the sad part? They didn't take their babies. They bought poor babies. They bought rejected babies to take and sacrifice to Moloch so their fields would be better. See, I look at those stories, and I think, man, look at all them gods they worshipped. Was those just like, you know, like mythological? Like, no. They were demonic. They were demonic beings. You know what happened? Jesus came, and he, he drove them out. Right? Jesus came. He drove out Baal. He drove out Moloch. He, he, brought, he brought redemption to all that. But if you guys know the scriptures all, you know when, when something evil is cast away, what's it do? It doesn't go away. It travels in waterless places looking for another place. It goes to a house that maybe was cleaned out like the USA. Maybe it come to the USA because we were cleaned out when we were built. We were built on the Bible. We were built with people that wanted the word of God and wanted a country built on it. But in 1970, our country says, oh, Moloch, come on back. We're going to sacrifice our babies to you. What do you do? He come I just lost everything. He come back sevenfold. The Israelites killed thousands of babies. Up to date, documented, 60 million. The USA has sacrificed 60 million babies that we know of. Comes back sevenfold. I can't, you look at that and I'm like, I don't even want to go to the next generation. We're pushing towards pagan. If, if, we're, if sacrificing our own children because it gets in our way, if it gets in the way of my plans, that's paganism. It's paganism. It's evil. All right, 60s, I'm done with you. Sorry, if you grew up in that time, I know it was awesome. Um, let's move on to the 80s and 90s. It doesn't get better, right? We've been giving our kids over. It doesn't get better. Romans 1, 26 through 27, I believe, is God telling us what happened in this, the, the um, 80s and 90s. It's the millennials. 
81 through 96 is the actual millennials. So let's read this scripture. Let's talk about this. For the reason God gave them up to their dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those who were contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and was consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So we're getting into times that I grew up in. Did we start turning back as a nation? Nope. We just keep progressing. We keep giving our kids away. We keep progressing. As Christians, we keep letting it happen. We keep letting it happen. God gave them up to their dishonorable passions. Welcome to the 80s and 90s. Gave it up. LGTB starts to ramp up in the news. Like I said, I, I'm not here to make friends today. If you hate me, this is over. This is all out of love. When it's wrong in the Bible, it's wrong. Amen. When it's wrong in the Bible, it's wrong. And I'm going, if I'm told to speak it, I have to answer for that. You don't have to answer for what God tells me to say, but I do. And someday I'm going to stand there and I'm going to answer. If I wouldn't have preached this and he said, why didn't you preach it? I'd have to answer, so I'm going to preach it. LGBT starts up in the news, starts up in the public. It was once an underbelly. It was once a in the darkness, in the shadows. It wasn't talked about, right? Starts in the mainstream. There was a movement back in the 60s. Sorry, 60s. But it happened in 69, so it was almost the 70s. It was called the Stonewall Riots. It was a gay bar in New York City that started all of LGBT. I'll get that wrong here in a minute. And the pride movement. It was all because the cops went there to break up this gay bar. And there was a six-day riot started it. Six days they rioted, and it started the whole pride movement. There's a whole other story here I could get into where I think they just invited another ancient god back into the U.S., but I don't have time. But right then at the Stonewall Riots, June 1969, Pride started running rampant. LGBT started running rampant. And Hollywood took notice. The media took notice. And what's the U.S. do? They take notice. Right? They take a promise of God, the rainbow, and make it their flag. Slap in the face of God right there. You say it's not right, we'll make the rainbow our colors. Minus one color, by the way. They slap God in the face using a promise to never flood the world, using a trigger, who was here last night to listen to my message, a trigger that says, I'll never flood the earth again for a Christian, is now I can be my own God, I can sleep with who I want, and I can do anything I want. Slap in the face. An apostasy turning away from God in every right. It starts to push even more away from God, calling what's good wrong, what's righteous wrong what's what's not according to god you're speaking hate against people it just changes everything a world turning to hate and injustice they take hollywood takes movies to a whole new level 80s and 90s whole new level i just i just grabbed a few because i could this stuff could go on forever you start googling this stuff popular movies in the 80s and 90s listen to this some of the stuff 1990, The Witches. I told you there's a push in the 60s back to the occult and witchcraft. That didn't slow down. The Witches was a 1990 movie about a young boy who stumbles into witches and starts into witchcraft. Um, First Wives Club, three divorced women seek revenge against their husbands for leaving them for younger women. Divorce right there in your face. Um, look who's talking, single mom, career-minded has a baby out of wedlock and raises it. It's a push from our media to push away what God says is right to condition us to, oh, this ain't that bad. And I'm right here, I don't know about us. I'm not talking about the nation. I'm talking about us. The devil can use anything. Top TV shows. Listen to the darkness. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I watched a lot of these, okay? I'm, not a, I'm preaching to myself. Charmed. I mean, Buffy, the vampire slayer, is pretty self-explanatory. Charmed, three sisters battle the forces of evil using witchcraft. Beverly Hills 90210, a bunch of single people partying all the time, right? 
Yeah, I watched it. I actually used to, what was that dude's name? Brian Austin Green. I got, I got like four or five times we had people come up just they thought I was him. No, I'm not him. I promise. Um, look who's talking. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm down here. Oh, Craig's going to be mad at me. South Park came out in the 90s. It's a cartoon, vulgar language, sexual in the windows, had it all. Cartoon. Wings. Used to watch that. If you don't remember that, a little plane flew from Nantucket back and forth. They were the first show during prime time, during family television, showed two people in the bed having sex. Public TV, 7 o'clock. They got interrupted because she threw a bra too close to the fireplace and it caught on fire. Will and Grace, a gay lawyer living with a straight lady, going through life. See, the, the, the media, the mainstream is pushing what God says is wrong is not. We're a nation running away from God, and the media and the news is saying it's okay. As a nation, we're falling for it, and as a Christian people, we're falling for it. I feel like we're falling for it all the time. I could go on and on in the 80s, but another pivotal moment. 1980, Ten Commandments, out of the school. Out of our public squares. Let's push God out of it a little bit more. You guys see something happening in our world? It's pretty scary when you all lay it out like this, isn't it? It was to me. When I started laying it out all week, studying the scripture over and over, just this many scriptures of God's like, that's, that's this era. That's this era. Look, my, my, pe my people are doing that right now. The nation's doing it for sure. There's also times I believe God's saying, look, my people are doing that. My people are doing that. There's a, a continual turning away, turning away in, in the 80s and the 90s. Rock and roll got crazy. Think about all the dark bands that started in the 80s and 90s. Corn, Nine Inch Nails. Man, going back, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, but seriously, and I, that's not in my notes. That's just coming up in my mind, like, Man, the bands got dark. They got dark. Marilyn Manson, which was the one that bit the head off the chicken? Ozzy Osbourne. That's probably the 80s, but. Yeah. Things are getting dark, and we're doing it. We're allowing it. We're allowing it. So let's go on. Does it get better? No. So let's get to today, Gen Z's. Well, actually, today's not Gen Z. I learned that this morning. But let's get to Romans 1, 28 through 32, and let's, let's hear what's happening right now. And you know what's sad? It's really, if you, if you got your Bible and you look, if you look at, of course, mine's easier to see. So here was the first part. Here was that first generation in the 50s, kind of short. 60s and 70s got a little longer. 80s and 90s got longer, and then look at us. We're even longer. It's pretty crazy to see it. But Romans 1, 28 through 32. And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God... God gave them up to the devise in the mind, and they ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliceness. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, Though they know God's righteous decree, for those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Woo! There's a lot there. I've got nine minutes to get through this generation. We're in trouble. You guys believe in miracles? Amen. You're going to see one if I get this done in nine minutes. Okay. So here we are, right? Here we are. This is... This is basically the, the late 90s through the 2000s, the Gen Zers. As a nation, we don't see it fit to acknowledge God. Yeah? I'm talking as a nation. I'm not talking about you guys sitting here. As a nation, we don't see it fit to acknowledge God. We're filled with unrighteousness, evil. Did you hear all those words? Listen to it. You can, if you watch the news, you can see all these. Evil, covetous, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliceness, gossip, slander. Haters of God, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. America. I mean America. Yeah, that's us now. Homicide per 100,000 residents in 1950 was less than five. Rose to 11 in the 80s. 
man, we got to really bad in the 80s. It's settled around 9 or 10 right now, according to the numbers. I'm not sure those are right. I think they hide a lot. I sure hear about a lot more than that. School shootings out of control. Riots, thousands die. What was it a couple weeks ago when there a, a soccer game where how many died? Like thousands died. Thousands at a hockey game because they rushed the field. Man, riots are out of control. They burn cities to the ground. They leave a path of destruction. Believing in God's word and truth has become narrow-minded. It's considered hate. It's definitely considered hate in the eyes of the average American person. If you don't believe in the, that I can love anybody, get married to anybody, you are spreading hate. No, we're not. We're spreading truth. I love you. I, if you're sitting in this room and you're homosexual, I love you like I love Tucker. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And when it's all said and done, I'm still going to love you if you don't believe that God says it's wrong. I'm still going to love you. That's not what this is about. It's about a whole country pushing away. It's about people starting to, I think there's Christians, I know there's Christians, I know there's churches that are marrying homosexuals in their churches. That's wrong. I'll say it right now. Dustin called out 13 denominations last week. I'll call out a few. I don't know how much hate mail he got, but I sent him some, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you got to do stuff every once in a while for fun. Keep him on his toes. You send it from somebody else, though. Um, so... <laughs> But seriously, believing in God is just like, it's, if, you're, if you're out, if you watch the news, I try not to, but if you watch the news and stuff, man, we're the minority. We're the minority, the way we think, the way we, the way we do things. I'm going to talk about some groundbreaking stuff that's happened. 2003, government legalized same-sex marriage. An apostasy, a turning away. God, you, you, I know God says this is wrong, but the lawmakers decided it was right. Legalized same-sex marriage. What'd they do? They lit up the White House in what? A rainbow. God, we're done with you. As a nation, we're done with you. We're going to follow. Well, I can't say it. I ain't got time to talk about it. We're going to follow this other way. We do not want your narrow-minded. We do not want your rules in our country anymore. A government once founded on God, like we talked about, leaded by God, began a turning away in public like never before. See, I told you I was going to mouth every area. I'm going to. I look back at that scripture. What's it say? Inventors of evil. I look back and read the Israelites. Man, they's evil. They ain't got nothing on us. And we're inventing new ways to be more evil every day. I heard the other day how fast, how fast, technology was advancing and it is scary scary and it, you know what it's done it's inventing new evils we see that in the church we see it in denominations accepting what god says is wrong and saying no it's okay it's okay we'll we'll marry that couple we'll let homosexual pastors take the stage i've seen it it's happened in our state you think oh we're not that stuff don't happen around here it's happening here it's happening in this town. All this stuff we're talking about, it's all around us. We have our heads in the sand saying it ain't. I don't know if you want to go down with the ship, but I don't. I want to fight. Amen. I want to fight. We watch marches and protests to defund the police. Why? Because they stood up for the laws of the land and to protect us. So what are we going to do? We don't like it. We're going to defund them. We're going to push them out. Push them out. Have we not seen it over and over in the last little bit? I, I look at these generations like, man, they were flying towards the demise of this country. And then I looked at our generation. I looked at now, and I'm like, we're on an express train. We're on an express train. Defund the police. Gay pride. Half-dressed women on the streets. My body, my choice. I've seen it in Springfield. Me and Tara. A vaccine comes out, it ain't your body your choice no more. Seriously. What's wrong is wrong. What's right is wrong. What's wrong is right. Is my body my choice till it comes to something they think you should have? And I'm talking to the government on that part. No boundaries left across in Hollywood. I don't even know where they could go. 
I don't. I started hitting movies, controversial movies of the 2000s. Number one was Wells Pretty Well Tied, Brokeback Mountain. Two gay cowboys created a love affair, had sex on the movie. In the, I, don't, I didn't watch it. Anybody watch it in here? Ain't nobody brave enough to raise their hand. <laughs> Tucker was over here like. Brokeback Mountain, one of the top movies. Evil. Darkness. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey. Absolute filth. Not even going to ask. There may be people watching here. Absolute filth, pornography, in the public eye now. It's, it's not pornography. It's not what was once over here. It's right here. Like, it was, it's such a push away from God. It's crazy, crazy. Every movie, every movie, nudity, language, witchcraft, homosexuality, they cover it in almost every movie. You know why? Money talks. Money talks. They want to push the boundaries. They want to push the mindset. They want to change a generation. So next one's even worse if we're even here. Think about it. They get your kids. They get the nation. And I'm talking when they, and I, when I'm saying they, I'm talking about the devil. When he can get your kids, he gets the nation. He's done it every generation. He's done it to my generation. He's doing it to the, our kids right now. They see so much filth, it is nothing. There is stuff that my kids see daily, I guarantee it, that would embarrass me when I was in high school. Guarantee it. And you know what they do? <sniffs> Nothing. No reaction. No reaction. I got a minute left, man. I got to fly. Um, it drives the community. Money talks, right? We talked about it. Why is it movies? They're greedy. They're greedy. Greed drives everything. Watch TV, like Tucker said, and try to find a commercial without a gay couple in it. Go, go home, watch some football today, something decent, but watch the commercials. You cannot see a commercial without a gay couple in it on public television. You cannot see it. It's in our face all the time. Why? Because they're just making it where it's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. I'll say it over and over. I remember a few years ago when the Farmers of America got all up and mad because Ford gave money to Pride. Do you think Ford quit? Do you think we quit buying Fords? <laughs> Amen. Curly Rawlings quit buying Fords. That a boy. So, I mean, seriously, we come in an uproar at one time, but why, why did it not change? Money's louder than God's truth. The transgender movement explodes as of late. Right now, there's 72 genders in the USA that are acknowledged. Not counting male and female. 74 if you want to count those that God created. There's 72 that the U.S. created. Can you see a downfall in our government? This movement has clearly said, I can be my own God. I can make my own decisions for myself. I can be whatever I want to be, not what God said I was. It's a turning away. Our government's forcing insurance companies to cover gender-affirming care. They're making them cover gender-affirming care. If you know what that is, that means if you want to go to the hospital to get a surgery done or something, insurance has to cover it. It's evil. It is evil. November 2020, Oregon makes a law. Minors 15 years old and up can go and have and get gender altering tax funded cross sex hormones and puberty blockers without their parents even knowing in Oregon 2020 verse 30 inventors of evil that's inventors of evil gets worse october 1st 2021 the great state of california governor gavin newsom i'll call him out passes a bill that children can make life-altering decisions without their parents' knowledge, and the hospitals have to do it. They can be sitting in class. Your young son can be sitting in class and say, today I want to be a girl. That teacher is supposed to take him to the hospital, and that hospital is supposed to either start the process on gender blocking or surgery. No age limit. 
It's evil. It's a turning away. It's happening in front of our face. I hide my, I had to do all this study because I hide my head in the sand. I act like I don't want to know, but I think we need to know it. I think we know the injustice. This country is on a downward slide fast. Fast. Transhuman movement. Another movement I learned about a little bit ago is, I told you, technology is exploding. They have BMIs, brain-machine interfaces. Elon Musk, if you guys know Elon Musk, has Neuralink. They implant a computer in your brain, and then the other person has one, and you can communicate without talking, and you can see each other's thoughts. You can do everything through computers. It's happening right now. This is not like, oh, in the future, they can do this. They're doing it. You have people like Elon Musk with his type of money, you can do it. It makes our brains work together. I learned today that this generation is called the Alpha. You think that's an accident? The beginning? Listen, they're wanting to start a whole country with God completely out of it. They want us gone. I'll be honest with you. They want us gone. They want narrow-mindedness. They want what God calls right out of here. They worship. In the old times, I told you that money drives everything. We're ruthless, right? In old times, they worshiped a golden bull. She's got a picture of it. Moses goes up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. He takes too long, so what do we do? We make a golden bull, and we start worshiping it. Man, we do this as America. You don't think we do this as America? What do we worship in America? Money. What's setting in New York City at the stock exchange? A golden bull. We set it right there. We invite the ancient world right back in. We're like, God, we're done with you. We're going to be just like the Israelites. We're going to be just like them. We drop a golden bull right here. What's most important to America? Money. At all costs, money is the most important thing. You want to hear the sad part is a few feet away from this, I've never been there. I'd like to go to Washington, or Washington. I'd like to go to New York, but I've never been there. A few feet away from this is a statue of George Washington where he took the inauguration to start this great country in New York City a few feet from there, and he kissed the Bible when he's done because we were started on the foundation of this, and they take an ancient bull that they're going to worship evil and set it right in the place where we all started this. A turning away, and we're letting it happen. An absolute apostasy of this nation. Any surprise how we let the enemy in without even knowing it? How many seen that bull in person? Yeah. How many ever thought about it in that aspect? I didn't. Until I started studying it. Yeah, until I started studying it. Right? I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to meet freely in public. I really don't. I really don't. I mean, I'm being honest with you guys. I love you guys. I want to be honest with you. But I wonder when it's to that, how many is going to be in this building? I mean, I can't even answer for myself. Am I strong enough? Am I bold enough to walk in here? I think I am. But where does that leave us as a nation? Where does that leave us for America? Because at the end of this, I was depressed. You probably are too. But I'm going to tell you, there is hope. There's hope. Let's get to the hope before I close out, all right? I'm not going to leave you on that, that terribleness that we're driving down because we are. So pray for your nation. Pray for your leaders. Go vote. Vote the Bible. I don't even care. I'm not even going to talk about what side to vote. I'm talking about both the Bible. Do some research. So where does it leave us in the I think of Sodom. What did God say in Genesis about Sodom in 18? Suppose there is 10 found there. What will he do for the sake of those 10? I will not destroy the nation. If I can find 10. He started at 50, by the way. If I can find 50 righteous in this giant town, I won't. But he got down to 10. Are we the 10? church? Are we the 10 that's keeping this nation going? Are we? Are we doing enough? Are we doing enough? I feel like we are the 10. I do. I feel like the only reason God still even remotely has his hand on this nation is because of me and you and all the churches around this great nation that are still preaching the truth, preaching the word of God. No matter what happens, they're going to preach the word. I believe we're the 10. But there's still even more hope than that. In 2 Chronicles 17, 14, I'll close with this. But what if my people, 
who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear them from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. It ain't over. It ain't over for the U.S. It ain't over for us yet. We're still here. We're still breathing. God could rapture me within the next sentence, and I'm okay with that. But it ain't over. He says right there, he will heal our lands, but if we got some stuff to do. We got some stuff to do. We got some stuff to be intentional about. We got some stuff to stand on. We got some promises to stand on. We have to stand on the promises. Do we still love people that believe that? Absolutely. You know why? Because you never know what God's going to use to show them truth. You never know what God's going to use to show them truth. You just, but if we, we truly humble ourselves and seek, and there's a difference in just praying and seeking. There's a big difference. See, I, I, I truly, I heard this statement, we don't, we're not living in the end of the world, but I can promise you we're living in the world of the end. Like, think about it. Let that soak in. We're not li living in the end of the world, but we are definitely living in the world of the end. If you read the last chapter of the book, it's playing out. We're living in that world of the end. There's no better day than today to get things right. I think about a great, these great movies. What's the best part of the movie? Last 15 minutes, right? I believe God put every one of us in the last 15 minutes for a reason. I believe he put us in the last 15 minutes of this crazy movie so we can come in with him and save a country, save a people. But what's it take if my people will humble themselves? We're going to open up the altars. I, I pray for this country constantly. If you're not saved today, today's the day. I hope if you're not saved, you see what kind of world we're diving to, and there is no better time than today to get things right. No better time. I said everything I said today because I believe what is in this book right here. I believe it. I do my best to live it. When I have questions, this is my guidance. This is what I go to. I go to brothers that know it better than me. But the answers are right here if you look for them. I pray today that we truly humble. We humble ourselves. We pray, we seek the face of God, give time for him to talk. Just let him change the name. Let's give the Lord a hand and some praise this morning. Amen. It is wonderful to see everyone out at uh, Renovation Church this morning. The pastors are going to be out near the doors. So if you have any questions, any concerns, uh, make sure that that's why they're going there right now is to make sure and take these up. Um, <clears throat> one new thing we have, if you look down here, um, now most preachers pull, preach from pulpits. We preach from a table saw here at Renovation. So if you're wondering what's going on here, then, you know, the Lord gave, it, gave us this thing for free. So we're going to keep it. We're gonna, he gave it to us for free, and we're going to use it till it's worn out. Down here, there's a prayer bowl. If you have any prayers, anything going on, fill it out, write it, write it down. We don't care. Anonymous, put your name up, whatever works for you. Just write it down, put it in here. We're going to pray over these things on Wednesday nights, okay? So if you have anything, write it down, bring it up. Um, tithe boxes are on the uh, wall out there uh, next to the doors. Also, we have an app that you can uh, download. Tara, could you throw that one picture up if they work? So I sent some picture. I don't know if these things will work or not. I had to share something with you, okay? And please pay attention to me because this is kind of a big deal. It's kind of been on my mind a little bit. I wanted to share this with you. Um, and it's about all of our calling. And so... Uh, I personally have problems sometimes witnessing to people. Does anyone else have that issue? Anyone else have fear issues? Three of us. Come on. Re really? You guys get a whole go in? Okay, here's, listen to this quick story. And this is true. So I have been studying here lately the Nuremberg trials. Okay? So, and if you guys don't understand, the Nuremberg trials are some, the, the people that were put on trial after World War II were some monsters. Okay, Th these were people that had ordered the extermination of Jews and all these other peoples. They had made sure that millions of Russian soldiers died just because they got put in POW camps with no buildings. They were open air. They were just fenced in in the middle of winter in the middle of Siberia. 
Okay, these people were horrible. So after World War II, the U.S., the, the United Kingdom, Russia, and France decided these people had to be put on trial. Now look at this guy, and this is what I want to talk to you about. This guy right here is a guy named Pastor Garretke, all right? Guy from a small town in Missouri, okay? Grew up, became a Lutheran pastor, winds up being a chaplain for the Army in World War II. End of World War II, the uh, folks come to him, the, ge the generals, and say, these people in the Nuremberg jail that are awaiting trial got to have a chaplain, and you're it. Okay? So he spoke German, so they sent him over. He was the guy that had to go witness to and serve the spiritual needs of some of the worst human beings that have ever been born. Okay? So he has to go into this jail of twenty, the first 21 that get trial. Guys like Gehring and guys like Rudolf Hess and Borman and all these people. You'll read about them, and, and they're as bad as anything you'll ever read about in the Old Testament. And he's it. One 50-some-year-old guy who's a chaplain and who was brought up at a little bitty farm town in Missouri. And they say, you're it, here you go. So he gets to walk in there around these people. Now, and the part of the reason I'm bringing this up, and we're going to get to the scripture here in a minute, it's the same scripture that we looked at last week, but it's talking about how much you love your brother and who is your neighbor, okay? So he has to go in. Out of the 21 people in the first trial, 10 of them come to Christ, okay? Now, the other ones don't. Now, here's another thing that he has to do. Ten of those people in the first trial get the death sentence. He has to walk with them to the gallows, and some of them were men that had come to Christ. Get your brain around that for a second, okay? He's sitting there praying with them and preaching to them until they have the hood pulled over their face, all right? Here's what I'm wanting to get to with this. Look at, does he look like Superman? No, Okay. He was God's dude at, in that time, and he was there. Think about this. Now, you might be thinking, wow, he must have had some super faith, and he did. And you might be thinking, wow, he was put into a supernatural position. that He's like the guy for this entire portion of history. That's right. But understand this. Everyone you talk to is going to die. He was the last thing standing between 21 monsters in eternity. Ten of them came to Christ. Now, how many of the people that you come into contact with this week are going to go out and have no next day? You need to understand something. The calling to which you have from this church is the most important calling you can imagine because it is eternal. Would you put that scripture up for me, please, Tara, real quick before we go? This is the same scripture I read to you last week, and I just want to read it to you again. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The question might come to you, who is your neighbor? Okay? Um, well, it's anybody. Here's what you don't get to do. You do not get to pull out your paper Bible and take your pencil and put a comma here and fill in. And as a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself as long as they're pretty. As long as, as, long as they've never been in prison. Okay. What if they're homosexual? Do you have to love them? Yep. Okay. What if, you, what if they have big parties and what if they have junk in their front yard? What, what if they have stupid bumper stickers on? What if they have tattoos in places that, that you don't approve of? Shut up. Amen. Right? Amen. If a 50-year-old chaplain can, from a little bitty town in Missouri can go stand up to monsters that are absolutely worse than the worst demon of hell I ever thought about being, you can be that person. Okay. You may be that last person they get to see. So if you get that chance, you need to take advantage of it and make sure you're listening to God. Amen? Let's pray to him.